with Kennedy Karaja and I am the social media director at AMASB. Today we're speaking with award-winning director, writer, and producer Justin Ward. Hi, Justin. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course, thanks for being here. So Justin is a seasoned professional in the entertainment industry and recently worked on his very first two feature films, The Meanest Man in Texas and Relish. His third feature film is called The Fur Furry Fortune and has yet to be released. Justin has worked with networks such as National Geographic, The Travel Channel, Spike TV, and many, many more. Justin, can you please tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and give a synopsis of The Meanest Man in Texas and Relish? Absolutely, glad to. Um, yeah, so I, I come from a background where my first job actually I worked for Mick Jagger uh, in development um, as assistant to his producer. So I owned a theater company where I graduated from uh, UC Santa Barbara. I uh, was fortunate enough to stumble upon this job working for Mick Jagger. Um, and I was able to read books and see what he was sort of um, developing into films. So I sort of, it was nice to be behind the scenes and be able to read some of these things. Um, and I did film for quite a few years until I met my wife. And then I had an opportunity to uh, direct and produce um, extreme sports uh, for Eurosport, for ESPN, for Fox, Fox Sports Net. Um, and it just seemed like a chance to travel the world and do something interesting. So after about, uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't even know how many, but I, I kind of looked at it and I said, you know, it'd be far more interesting to shoot these like documentaries than to shoot these programs like a uh, football game. So I pitched it to ESPN. They weren't real thrilled with the idea, but um, they ended up allowing us to do it. Um, and then my 14 half hour shows became 52 hours the next year. So we just exploded. And of course, during that time, extreme sports was taken off. I think the only documentary style shows at the time were like road rules on MTV. Um, so I really got into storytelling. And so for me, it became not about just filming a competition, but through documentary filmmaking of these events, I was able to really tell the story. So storytelling became really what I loved. And that's sort of, I think, a through line through everything I do. So to me, the genre, uh, whether it's a documentary, whether it's narrative, whether it's a corporate event, whatever it is, storytelling is the number one thing that keeps me engaged in every project I do. Um, so my first film, uh, fortunately, came um, around 2015. I got offered to read this book called The Names Man Texas, which was based on a true story. Uh, Clyde Thompson is a real person who uh, was mistakenly put into prison. Uh, he killed someone in self-defense, but he was blamed for two, two murders, um, but was convicted of one and went to jail. Now, here was a you know, young boy, 16, 17 years old, who, who literally lived in the backwoods farm of Texas and had, you know, he had a little bit of a temper, uh, but for the most part, he was just a good Christian boy. And he ended up gaining the moniker the meanest man in Texas because of what the prison system did to him. Um, and in order to survive, Clyde Barrow, actually, a Bonnie and Clyde, gave him advice and said, you know, if you're going to basically be a uh, survivor, you're going to have to be a rattlesnake. You're, you, you can't be nice. You've got to kill first. So he took that advice to survive and ended up becoming the meanest man in Texas. What's beautiful about this story to me and why I had to tell it was it was a place, it was, he, he was a man who society had deemed one thing, but at his core and who he was was something different than what they believed him to be. Um, and he met a woman while he was in there named Julia, who was basically, she was deformed and she had scoliosis, so she had a big hump. And she too was viewed as this hunchback and he was viewed as a killer. And neither one of them were anything close to what they were. She was the most beautiful person on the planet. She was the most articulate, intelligent woman. I would love to do a story just on her. I mean, she went up against the prison system in Texas as a woman in the 1930s and won. I mean, this woman's incredible. Um, her story deserves to be told. So I saw this as a man who found a faith, a man who found love of his life, and a man who found a true calling, and a woman who did the same. And the two of them came together in a perfect you know, connection and, and changed so many lives. Um, and it, it was a story I had to tell. Um, and I'm very proud of that film. We were very fortunate that it was an ultra low budget, uh, which made, basically we had a dollar to make. And we shot it in 11 days. And it ended up going theatrical. 
Uh, and so that movie was seen in theater, uh, theaters around the United States. And to me, that was the biggest honor that I could ever be a part of. So, um, so that's The Meanest Man in Texas. Uh, Relish um, was something that um, I had met with the uh, producer, Terry Narduzzi, and she had come to New York Film Festival and saw The Meanest Man in Texas and said, hey, if I invested in something, what, what film would we do? And so I pitched this idea of five teenagers who break out of a mental facility and go on a life-changing road trip led by a transgender male. And Terry is from the theater world and she is 100% behind the LGBTQ community. And she fell in love with the idea and we developed it a little bit. And then I went off and wrote the script and then we ended up making the movie. Um, and, and again, another one that I'm extremely proud of um, I think it, uh, again, is about, you know, people who um, are put into boxes and, and, and sort of society sees them in a certain way. Uh, and I wanted to break those norms and break out of that box and show people that we are all much more than whatever moniker you put on us. Whatever you think I am as a person, um, I'm much more complex. And same thing with everybody. Um, and that's a really important theme that I have in all my films. Okay, so Justin, as marketers, we're professionals that are very relationship-based. One of the relationships you made in your career was with Brad Wilson, a producer and co-CEO of Higher Purpose Entertainment, who approached you to direct The Meanest Man in Texas. Since then, you've worked with him on multiple, uh, you've worked with him multiple times and maintained a professional relationship. So in the marketing industry and in any industry, networking can take your career in various, various directions and provide opportunities. So can you expand on uh, where your partnership with Brad Wilson started and where it is now and any tips you have for marketers looking to expand their network? Yeah, I mean, certainly in, in I think, any industry, but certainly in the film industry, uh, relationships are the be all and end all of your career. Uh, if you work with crews and you're not a good director, those crews aren't going to want to work with you again. If you work with an investor and you don't get them their money back, they're not going to want to work with you again. Um, and so I've always taken the approach in anything and everything I do that um, as long as we're making a project, but whoever I'm dealing with, whether they're my investor, my producer, my first AD, my actors or the crew, there has to be a human relationship. And that takes the priority over the project itself. So I always joke around that it's like, oh, we got to do what we have to do for the project with the caveat that we also are humans making a project. So let's make that the most important thing. Um, and so, so for me, Brad Wilson was a perfect example. He and I had met through my daughter, ironically, and I was doing documentaries at the time and I was doing NFL and I was doing NASCAR, um, all, all the, um, the promotional side of, of those sports uh, is what I was doing. So a lot of trailers and a lot of teasers and a lot of um, uh, features and a lot of things that were sort of selling whatever programming they were doing. So I was sort of on an advertising side, if you will. Um, and, and I met Brad and, and told him that, you know, he and my daughter were doing a project together in elementary school. And I think we spent probably a good two weeks together and we never once mentioned what we did. And then finally, at the end of the conversation, after a few margaritas, we said, uh, what do you do? I'm a producer. What do you do? Well, I'm a director producer as well. He's like, oh, well, what do you do? And so I told him that I work with NASCAR and I do this thing. He's like, oh, well, I do film. And of course, I go, well, ironically, what I really want to do is direct a film. And he was like, oh, cool. Nothing happened, right? So then um, I had created a teaser, which was uh, sort of a selling point of a script that I had made. And I sent it to Brad for advice. I said, hey, you're a film producer. What do you think of this pitch? teaser that I made about this film. And he's like, uh, I want to finance it. I want to find money for you. So he went around and started looking for money. In the meantime, he had come across uh, the book, The Meanest Man in Texas, and called me up and said, hey, uh, I was really impressed with your teaser. I want you to direct this film. So I think here's a perfect example of what I see as life. You know, we had met as friends. Uh, the human connection was there. Uh, because of that, we wanted to work together. Um, and then from that, he saw I assume talent, and um, we ended up making a movie together, and that's kind of how it works. Um, uh, another thing, I, I just got a phone call from uh, this time last year from the uh, head of an agency, who uh, his name is Don, and and he had hired me back in 2011 to do a Lexus project, 
And that Lexus project was an international campaign. I traveled to five different cities. I shot all this amazing uh, footage for them, so selling this first hybrid that Lexus came up with. Um, I, I thought I did a great job. I never got called back. So I called, nobody called me back. Well, Don had left and I didn't realize that and they cleaned house and started over. This time last year, I got a phone call from Don saying, hey, I have another Lexus project. You killed it in 2011. I was so happy with that. First, I had heard about it. And he hired me again for another big Lexus project. And now this summer, I'm working on a Nissan project with him. So again, I just think that, you know, what may, I think that was a human connection that he and I had, delivered uh, a good product. Uh, and, and how many years later, a decade later, I get a phone call again, uh, for repeat business. And I think that's just how I see things is sort of like I did the best I could. I made a connection with him. And then a decade later, he, I was the first call when Lexus came back to, on his plate. Uh, and then because of that, he was able to recommend me for a Nissan project. So, uh, and now we're talking about moving forward in the future. I, I think that's again, the epitome of your question. It, it's, it is so important to find in whatever you're doing that human connection uh, and then you just do the best work you can. That's, at least that's my philosophy. Uh, let's talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. So start going back to uh, Relish and the Nina Santa, Texas. So you made it a point to veer away from stereotypes and avoid putting the character in these preconceived boxes in your film. So in your second film, Relish, you highlighted the LGBTQIA plus community, as you mentioned, with Kai, who is transgender. And when the film opens, we get a glimpse into some of the discrimination Kai is facing because of his sexual orientation. And even though he is in a private treatment facility that is meant to help him with his issues, uh, he does not find support, but regardless, he is um, an invincible force. So can you expand on the representation of the LGBTQ plus community in Relish and the origin of Kai's story? Absolutely. Um, I, I think for me, and I think this applies to what what you're doing as well with, with um, corporate and commercials and um, all of that. I, I think people make the mistake of not giving their audience um, the respect that they deserve and the intelligence they deserve. Um, and so I think that, you know, when I approach a corporate job, or whether I approach a film or whether I approach, you know, whatever it is, I, I, a teaser, a trailer, a commercial, I always go in with the idea that people are gonna get it. They're gonna understand on some level, whether they do intellectually, whether they just get it. Uh, and they're gonna want the product if they want the product um, or see the movie if they wanna see the movie. Um, and so for me, it was really important. Um, one of the things that I was tired of was watching movies where a gay person uh, or anyone from the LGBTQ, especially transgender, was treated as a victim. And I really felt like if I'm gonna make a film with a transgender lead, I'm not making the same film everyone else in Hollywood is making because I'm tired of it and I don't think they're doing it right. And I haven't liked any of them. So as, as good as some of them are, I did not like that it just became perpetuating the stereotype that be, just because you're transgender, you're a victim. I'm not gonna buy into that. So. When I set out to write Relish, my whole goal ultimately at the end of the day was I'm writing a character that will not be a victim. That's not to say that that person doesn't have obstacles because that's good storytelling. That's not to say that that person doesn't suffer because that's human nature. That's not to say that that person isn't gonna be uh, offended or treated horribly or have to deal with a decision that could change their life or ruin their life. Um, all of those things is good storytelling. But that doesn't mean that I have to do that by making them a victim. And so that really was my number one reason for writing the role of Kai was to say, I'm breaking this stereotype that I'm tired of watching and I'm, I'm doing something different. Um, and, and ironically, I wrote, I wrote it, and a lot of people sort of would question why I did this, but I wrote it first. And then I sent it to the LGBT community to read. And I was astonished at how many people told me that I had written their story and that it was refreshing not to see a victim because I didn't write a transgender character. What I wrote was a real person. And I think that's what they appreciated and that's what really excited me about wanting to make the film 
was that they saw it as, hey, you wrote a real person who is transgender, not you wrote a victim who's transgender, or you wrote a tra what you think is a transgender character. Um, because writing the right verbiage or the right pronoun or the right um, you know, description or any of that is easy. But writing a true character is what matters. And I wanted a, excuse my French, but I wanted a badass to lead these kids out of this facility. And it wasn't gonna be some whining victim. That just wasn't gonna work for my story. Um, and so, so I'm very proud of that. And I think, you know, uh, Tyler who played Kai um, said it many, many times in many interviews and to me personally alone that, that he felt like I touched on his story. And that even though the circumstances were the same as his, he related 100% to it. And I've gotten hundreds of, of DMs and I've gotten hundreds of, of letters that, that have said the same, that there's all these people out there that said, thank goodness you didn't write a stereotype. Thank goodness you didn't write a victim. Thank goodness you wrote somebody I could look up to. And so that, that means the world to me. So that, that's, that was my goal and I feel like we accomplished it. It was a great experience and I, and I learned a lot. And I, you know, um, there's, a, there's a great quote um, where a director says, sometimes you don't know why you wrote the film until you wrote it. And then you learn the reason why you wrote the film. And, and I think that's why. I think I learned, I learned so much about that community and I learned so much about, um, you know, what they're going through and their struggle in, in writing that. And, and I had it intellectually, but it was nice to, to really talk to probably three dozen um, transgender males about this role and, and get their feedback and you know a couple of them slammed me and just hated the script and felt like it didn't even come close to what they you know but you have to look at it and go well what's the majority you know that's and so I encouraged them I said then you, you should go tell your story if this isn't your story you should go tell your story you know um, and, and I think they were taken back by that and, and, and I believe that to this day if, if, if you don't like the stories being told out there then you should go tell that story so in a 2017 IF, IFS Film Festival interview, you spoke on your first film, The Meanest Man in Texas, and the characterization of Clyde as a killer and Julia as a hunchback. You said, this is a story about people who uh, didn't accept those labels. In fact, they defined them regardless of how society saw them. And for me, that's the film that I wanted to make. So based on extensive research, uh, when you did the writing for The Meanest Man in Texas was Don Humphrey. I'd like to hear about how you developed authentic character representation, representation and storylines based on the true story of Clyde Thompson's life. Yeah, uh, it was a daunting task because I felt the weight of the importance of telling someone's story who his children are still, you know, his child's still alive. Um, he, had, he had adopted a daughter and she's still alive. So I, and, and, and that whole family is still alive. They're all, they all came to that actual uh, festival. Um, so there was about 20 of them there. And, and I felt that obligation and I felt that importance and the weight of that. Um, so I did as much research. I started um, sort of a generic overall um, research of the eras, you know, it spanned three decades. So I really tried to study systematically each one of them. I also studied the prison systems and how the prison systems worked in the 20s versus the 30s versus the 40s and the 50s. Um, so, so that was really important to me as well. When it came to the characters, um, I tried to connect with as many people that knew them. Um, I also lucked out because I had a lot of speeches that Clyde Thompson had done, audio tapes of him that had done, uh, and, and Mateus who played the role, uh, his voice was spot on. Uh, the daughter cried during the premiere because she said it was like watching her father talk because um, he had nailed it. Um, but we had that. We had those speeches that he had written and that he had you know, talked about. Um, and, and that was incredible and wonderful. It was really um, great to have her too, you know, um, and, and talk to her about Clyde and what was like. Talk to prison uh, wardens who were retired. Um, that, that had, you know, were basically you know, just guards at the time. Um, and just really did as much research as I could. Don Humphrey himself uh, had spent um, a lot of time when he wrote the book. Um, and so he was a huge, I mean, I leaned on him for so much uh, in terms of what, um, what Clyde was like as a person. Um, and, you know, Clyde was a, 
he was a tough guy. I mean, he'd gone through a lot and he had suffered a lot and uh, he had to, you know, he had to create this thick skin. So as, as much of a heart and as, and as wonderful as he was in his later years when he was a preacher, um, when he was the meanest man in Texas, he truly was the meanest man in Texas. He, he would kill relentlessly and, and didn't think twice about it. And if he felt it was him or I, and there was no, you know, justification for it. Um, and so really trying to understand somebody like that, you know, but what people said was while he did that, he was also super charming. And so that was a hard thing to get across that a lot of people are like, well, he's the meanest man in Texas. Shouldn't he be meaner? Well, you don't know the character. I didn't write a cliche. I wrote a character that was real based on a real person. So maybe you don't like that he's not mean enough for you, but that's not the story I'm telling. I'm telling the story of a real man who literally would smile as he killed someone. So, you know, he was that guy. He was charming and he was, that's why he became a preacher. It's because he had that charisma. He had that charm. Um, that's why he won over the warden who wanted to kill him, but didn't because he just had this charm to him. Um, and I think that's why when he finally became a, a preacher, he was so successful and moved so many people because he could go, I've been where you are literally. And probably what I've done is much worse than you've ever done. And so if I can find redemption, so can you. And that was important to tell that story for me, to make sure that we captured him and who he really was. And I think the, the most moving thing that ever happened, um, probably in my lifetime, dealing with any kind of uh, media was having Shirley, who was um, Julia and uh, Clyde's daughter, uh, lean over to Mateus uh, and, and, and Alexandra, who played Julia, and say, it was like an hour and a half of watching my parents on screen. Thank you. And to me, that's all that matters. That's, that's what matters, because we, we got that right. So many things we didn't get right on, on a low budget, but that we got right, and that, that means the world to me. So from that standpoint, I felt like we, we were successful. So do you have any like tips on strategy for researching, like maybe what you've learned over the years and um, some of the misses in film when people don't do the research? Yeah, I mean, you know, even with, you know, Relish, which was a made up story, I still, I had to research, you know, mental facilities, you know, and I did a lot of research and, you know, I think the hard thing is, is you have to remember what your story is, because what happens is, is a lot of people get bogged down in the research, and then they change their story. Uh, there are so many horrific stories from um, some of these private mental facilities that, you know, I, I could go do a film on just that alone. Um, but that's not the story I was telling. So I, I needed to be careful not to, to digress too much. Um, and so, so I think that's the biggest thing is when, when you're researching, whether it's a, like, you know, obviously it makes sense that I would do so much research on the meanest man in Texas. You know, I'm dealing with uh, Texas in the 1920s. I'm dealing with, uh, you know, the prison system. I'm dealing with jails. I'm dealing with judges. I'm dealing with, you know, people who, uh, you know, are no longer alive. So, you know, really to make that authentic, you really need to know where people are coming from. Um, with Relish, it was really important because I was dealing with the community that I you know, wanted to make sure that, that I did it right. Um, so I felt that responsibility, so I had to research that. I also was dealing with um, you know, a facility that if it wasn't portrayed properly, you know, what's the point? Now we're just, you know, now it's fictional and it's just, it's a joke. It's, it can't be a joke. It's gotta be something that's real. So when you see that this facility that actually is a working facility or could be, has no respect for Kai and what he's going through, that that's valid and real. Because otherwise, it's just me trying to make a statement and then it's not real. So I had to find, so I had to go and research and I, I actually talked to a lot of the head of those places. I've talked to people who've been fired from those places. I've talked to people who still work at those places. I lucked out uh, because Terry, who was the producer and investor, her daughter actually had worked at several of those places earlier in her career. So um, I was able to confirm a lot of my research uh, with her. Um, and, you know, and she had no, basically, as far as she was concerned, was, well, now, now I'm on it as a consultant, so I'm going to be as honest with you as possible. You know, it's not like, you know, she had, she gives us, no, 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 whatever, it's all good. Um, you know, one of the things that we fudged a little bit was that most facilities do not allow um, 
co-ed intermingling um, a lot, uh, but they do do it lunch and they do do it some, some recreational time. So I just focused on that, but mostly they're in separate wings and they're, they could never get to the other wing. So that was an area that I sort of broke that, but the only person that really does that is Kai and Kai's seen as a girl anyway. So I felt it was justified that he would be living with the women, even though he was uh, a male. Um, and I think that's why he could walk into Sawyer and ask me to roll him and be there. Um, so I felt comfortable breaking that rule um, because they would have treated her like a girl for the most part anyway, even though he identified as male. Um, and so in the big scene where they're all together, I had to get them together in order for them to break out. So I just took uh, one facility that allowed co-ed uh, game time together and I sort of used that as a generic thing. Everything else was 100% spot on. So um, I just made sure that I, I did that research. So I think, you know, for me, research is really important. I, I can't write unless I've done my research. But again, I think a lot of writers get bogged down in the research and that's where you find your problems is that, you, you know, I could have gone and told the whole story about, you know, a facility with corrupt uh, people and uh, totally gotten sidetracked. Um, so you have to remember what is your story, what story you're telling, and how does this, this feed the story as opposed to you trying to write your research. And I think that's a lot of mistake uh, a lot of people make. Is they make that mistake of, oh, I've got all this great research, i got to put it in my film. Uh, I would say maybe 2% of the research I did is in my film. Um, the rest of it is just there, so I know it. That's all. From both films, how would you write your characters to center them around community voices? And how would you like to extend this reach in future projects? Because I know that, um, especially in Relish, all the characters were so diverse. And so uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I think, you know, for The Meanest Man in Texas, uh, I was limited in the story that I told because the story was in a prison. Uh, and back then, unfortunately, they were segregated. So you did not have any diversity within the prison system. It was whites were in one prison and everybody else was in another prison. Um, and so after coming off of The Meanest Man in Texas um, and feeling like I had done justice to history and I had done it the way that it was supposed to be, I really wanted to sort of break out and, and do something that's more what I feel is my life, you know, my friends and my community and the people that I work with and, and know. And so I really wanted to do something with diverse. So I, what I didn't do is I didn't go and I didn't write, besides Kai, I didn't write any of the characters as a race. So I wrote them all generic and just focused on the character. Um, and then what I did was, as I said, based on the casting, who were the best actors? Um, and so Rio was the best actor for Theo. Uh, and Rio has, you know, a very Pacific Islander look and has, uh, you know, a, a lot of diversity within his race. Um, and then Sawyer, who uh, is Chinese, and um, same thing. She had, you know, she was the best actress for the role. So I chose her. Once I did that, um, the, young act, the young actor who played the, um, his name's Cameron, phenomenal actor. Um, he played the waiter at the, at the, um, the Relish Cafe. For me, that character had to be a character that could have been in this group. So the tragedy of the story is he didn't get to go along with them. And his story is a tragedy because he didn't get to go on that road trip with them, and he should have. But I had to, I, I had to make him somebody that could have been in this group. Um, so that role was really important to me. And when Cameron did his audition, he was amazing. But he was black, and I didn't anticipate that at all. Um, and so I, I spoke to him at length and I said, is there anything, it's written by a you know, middle-aged white man, is there anything in here that you would change to be more closer to you as a, as a person and as a, as a, as a black man? Um, and the same thing I asked Chelsea about uh, the Asian character. She's Chinese. Is there anything? Uh, and I asked point blank, I said, hey, you know, soybean was a joke before I knew that I cast an Asian woman. And she said, oh no, you have to leave that in because now it's an insult without her knowing it's an insult and I get it every day of my life. I get that joke and you have to leave it in because I need people to see me react to it on screen so they know how hurtful it is. So here she is trying to reach out to 
Chelsea's character or lead character is trying to reach out to her by saying, hey, I know what I'll call you, I'll call you soybean. And she thinks it's so cute because she's vegan, but really what it's doing is, is it's insulting her race. And Chelsea told me, begged me to leave it in there. But I would never have known that that should have been a thing or was such a thing for her. Um, and so we had candid conversations and I, I, I spent uh, a good day with every actor going through the script line by line, scene by scene, um, motivation by motivation, um, intention by intention, and I talked them through it and they talk, told, talked me through it and they asked me their questions and I point blank said, as a black person, how does this affect you? As a black person, is there anything you need to put in here? As, a, as an Asian, is it, because I don't know, I'm not any of those things. So I want to make sure that this is authentic and now that I've cast you, it's not just a character, your race comes with you, how do you feel about this? And, and I felt I was as open as I could be about it. Um, and it was a, not an easy conversation to have. It really wasn't, it was, it was tough. Um, but they all, uh, I'm, a, I'm about to cry, but they all were so open about it and wanted to share and wanted to talk about it. Um, and, and that opened the door um, to, for what I think is a better script. And they, they helped elevate my script. Well, one of, the things that, one of the things that he helped me with is he said, you know, it's so important as a young black man that, that you know, I do everything right. So everything I do has to be right. So that's why I'm saving for college. That's why the dancing that I really just want to be a dancer, but I'm going to college instead. So my dancing comes out when I'm, you know, cleaning up dishes. Um, you know, for him, you know, he had to break the rules and get a knife and, and, and do the tire thing, which he told me is the scariest thing in the world for him because, you know, he could, as we all know, that could be detrimental for a black man to be holding a knife and, and cause that kind of damage. Um, and so for him, everything had to be 100% by the book. Um, and so for him to have the freedom to be able to break out of that and to be celebrated for, 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 for not being perfect um, was really, really big. And, and I think that's the one thing that, that he felt was really powerful for him was to be able to do that. Um, and again, I don't want to put words in his mouth. These are conversations I've had with him. Um, but, but, but those are things that we don't think about. You know, those are the things that for me, it was just a character that was helping them out. For him, it was a really big statement uh, for that character. Um, and, 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 that, and I didn't write it that way. I didn't write it with that in mind, but it just worked out that way with him bringing, you know, his his background to the, the story and his race and his experience. Um, and I think that that was wonderful. And I'm just, I'm so grateful that they opened up and shared some of these things with me that I, I would have been oblivious to, you know, I, I just thought, Oh, how funny is it to have a guy in the, you know, restaurant who probably could be with them who wants to really dance, but is saving for money for college. That that's all it was. But for him, it was, you know, I'm a black man whose stereotype is that I have to dance but that I should be going to college. So I'm gonna choose college because that's the right thing to do. But I really just wanna dance, you know? And, and being caught in that stereotype, even that, that is a stereotype, you know? Um, and having to be caught in both those stereotypes and not knowing what to do. So I'm just gonna put on a happy face, you know? And then at the end, to be able to be wielding the knife, be able to stop a bad guy and go, I, I did this and I did it for people I care about because I support them and they let me have these two hours, which were the most fun of his life. So it just suddenly became layers upon layers. And, and him opening up and sharing that with me made me realize, you know, I could tweak the script a little bit to kind of guide it that way a little bit more. Yeah, and the thing about Levi too is, you know, um, what, I, what I did not want to do is I did not want to do your stereotypical, uh, it's been, you know, it's even gotten worse, but the stereotype of, um, you know, the jock who is a jerk, you know? Um, and so I wanted, when Levi was in the facility, he was living up to what he, everyone thinks he should be. And so he was playing the part that he was meant to play. I believe, because I come from a sports background, I believe that, you know, we as artists in general have such a low opinion of sports and sportsmanship and jocks that writers who have been, because of, I think their own egos have been bullied, um, hold those grudges against, you know, jocks. And if you watch any movie, rarely do you see a good portrayal of a jock. It's a horrible portrayal. 
And yet the ideals that sports is teaching these kids is far beyond important. It's essential. Um, and they're teaching them community. They're teaching them uh, to give back. They're teaching them team above all. You know what I mean? These are the, these, this is what sports is teaching us. So I think when Levi gets out of the situation where he's now feeling responsible for this group of people on the road, he implements those things that he learned. And, and some people are like, oh, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I wanted him to be a bad guy all the way through. I thought he was going to be the bad guy. I go, exactly. That's what you wanted because you're, tra you are trained to believe that that's what he should be. And so I needed to break that stereotype down and make Levi the one who suddenly is going, this is my team, cuddle, I got I to gotta take care of my team. This is, I may not like my team, but this is my team now. So he becomes a coach in a way. And I think that's the heart of who Levi is. He's just, unfortunately, between drugs and the expectations and the box he's been put in and the way that he has to live his life, can't really truly be that great person. And I think that this gave him an opportunity to go, I actually do believe in these things that I learned in sports, even though I say I hate sports and hate my you know, father and parents for making me do it and hate the drugs and hate, you know, facility. But at the end of the day, he becomes a leader of trying to lead these. And he does it not as a jerk. He softens as the film goes on. And it was important for me to break that stereotype down because everyone thought when they started reading the script that Levi was going to be the, the antagonist all the way through. And I had to, in the first act, kill that because I don't want stereotypes. Could you talk about the key steps and considerations that need to be taken when writing a good story? Here's the thing. And I think this applies to, you know, hopefully everybody who's listening to this is that, you know, a good story isn't just a narrative film. You know, when I was doing documentaries, the story became the thing. When I did sports television, the story is the thing. If I do a travel show, the sport, you know, it's the story. If I do a trailer, more than anything, you need to know the story. A film can meander and get off track. A trailer trying to sell that story can't. It has to be very clear. Um, and I, I take that same approach when I'm doing corporate work. Um, if I'm doing a corporate project, it needs a beginning, middle, and end. It needs to tell a story. I don't care if it's you know an executive talking from beginning to end, it still has to tell a story. At the end of it, you have to have some sort of effect that you have on your audience. Um, and, and, and there has to be a call to action of some kind. In my films, the call to action is, as you said, can we start a dialogue about these hard questions? You know, the meanest man in Texas is, you know, there's so many things that we could, you know, the call to action is, you know, looking back at our history and making sure that we don't repeat it. Um, for Relish, it's having those hard conversations. Um, you know, the new film is uh, about, you know, two kids and a dog, um, and yet it still has a theme. I still want people to walk away from that movie going, you know, uh, uh, is buying a bunch of material stuff the most important thing in life? Is, is that the most important thing? You know what I mean? If you could have all the money in the world, would you be happy? I want people to ask questions after the movie. And so if you're doing a corporate project or if you're doing a commercial, uh, you still have to go in with the same sort of storytelling skills. And I think that is you have to put your audience in a position where they are open to questioning what they're watching and being open to accept what you're watching enough for them to experience it properly so that they can hopefully have a change of heart. So whether it's buy this product or whether it's you know, get into you know, the, the plights of LGBTQ plus community, or whether it's, you know, is the prison system the best system for, you know, redemption? Probably not, but we need to ask those questions. And I think that, that you have to put your audience in a situation where they're open to, you know, receiving the information properly. And, and that, that can be one person talking, it could be a video, it could be whatever you do. The, the elements of storytelling is your audience has to connect to the person that's telling the story or the story that they're watching. And when you put that audience in that person's place, it creates empathy. And I think empathy then opens up that opportunity for people to start to question or to, to decide what they want or how they want to make a change um, or just be open to listening. Um, and, and that all starts with putting them in a place that they're open to it. And I think having them be able to be in those shoes you know it's you know every commercial has you know i saw a tide commercial and they're like hey my family 
you know, we all do wash separately. And my wife instantly is like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And she didn't care about the commercial anymore because it was such a false thing. No one in their house, no one in, not, if you're in the household of five people and everybody washes their own clothes, that's an energy waste. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. So to, to us, it rang false and we went, Ty, you just failed. Your commercial failed because somebody at the storytelling level didn't go, that's not gonna work, no one's gonna buy that. It doesn't connect, you know what I mean? Um, and, and I think that's really important for everyone to do that, is to, to figure out whatever I'm making, how will my audience connect to it? And the broader the product or the broader the story, the more people you have to connect, you know what I mean? So for me, making Relish wasn't, hey, is every LGBTQ plus community gonna love this film? Um, or can everybody love this film? So if I'm just making it for that community, then I think I failed as a filmmaker. I have to make it for everybody to enjoy, you know? Um, and, and, and that's kind of, I think as a, if you're working in you know, commercials or corporate or anything like that, that's really important to really think about who is my audience and what's the best way to tell this story. And I don't care if the story is a turtle talking. I don't care if it's a, you know, executive, you know, hitting bullet points on a PowerPoint. It has to have the same elements. I've done a lot of, you know, corporate jobs. I've done, you know, again, you saw my automotive. I've done trailers for movies. I've done, um, you know, LA County Medical Center. I've done uh, Hawaii Convention and Visitor Bureau, Maui Visitor Convention Bureau. Um, I've done a lot for, you know, products, commercials. Um, the one thing that I think frustrates uh, <laughs> them more than anything, but in the end makes them so happy is when they come to me and they ask me to do it for them, whatever their project is. I always ask simple questions. I ask, who is this for? And then I decide how to get there. The ones I've always had problems with are the ones that come to me and say, we want to do this commercial and we want this thing flying here. Let this go in there. We're going to do this. And, we're going to, and they, they tell me all the bells and whistles. And I, I, I get so confused because I'm, I'm like, I'm glad you're excited about all the bells and whistles, but all the bells and whistles should be determined after you decide who you're marketing to and what your desired effect is. Um, because I can come up with any bell and whistle any time. And I'm so glad that you have, but the idea is, is that let's talk about what's important because sometimes simpler might be better. Because how many commercials have you watched where you laughed and then the commercial's over and you're like, what was that for? Yeah. Oh, great. They're witty. They're intelligent. They had bells and whistles. They had all kinds of cool shots. They had all kinds of cool stuff. I don't have a clue what they were selling. And to me, that, that commercial is a failure. Um, and so that's, that's really important when, you know, I think people get excited about, you know, media and they get excited about camera angles and they get excited about GoPros and they get excited about, you know, using a car crane and they get excited about all these things, you know, what if we jumped off a building and we had the camera strapped to somebody's chest? That's all great, but unless you know what your desired effect is and who your audience is, none of those things should even be discussed. You know, all your storyboards, all of that should be done after you are very clear about what you intend to do. Because the way I work is I tell the story based on those two things that will determine hey, if I want to put this person in that point of view, then maybe a GoPro is the best choice, but only after we determine those two questions. Um, and so, yeah, I do get a lot of frustration in the beginning because I have everybody excited about all their ideas and they want to shoot this, they want to do that. And I always just come back to, okay, but I just need these two questions answered. That's all I need, these two questions. And nine times out of 10, no one has an answer. And so a lot of times I will come up with um, and, and it's really important as a marketer to know that for sure, because that's what's going to get you your product being sold. You know, at the end of the day, that's the goal. So anyway, that's, that's my two cents on, you know, marketing is um, having done, you know, 20 something years of it. It's really important to ask those questions first, um, because the storyboards and the way you're shooting it and what camera you're getting and what lenses are you shooting on? Those are the questions I get right out of the gate. And, you know, those are, those are all, you know, it's, it's kind of like asking uh, a race car driver, uh, what are you driving? Um, and, and him saying, well, what track am I on? 
<laughs> well, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know what, where I'm going or what track I'm on. Why, why would I choose my car first? You know, I choose, this, choose the tools depending on the journey. That's my point, is that you choose all the bells and whistles and tools and all that stuff when you know what your journey is. And once you know what your journey is, then you can decide, you know. Um, I don't choose my lenses before I write the script. I don't choose angles before I write the script. I do the storytelling first. I decide what story I'm telling, and then I find the tools in the industry that I can afford based on the budget that best tells that story. Um, I, I have friends who want to direct and they say, I, I love wide angles. I'm, my first film is going to have nothing but wide angles because I love the look of a wide angle. Or the opposite. I love, I love dollies and long lenses. And I'm like, okay, well, for me, a wide angle tells a very different story than a long lens. A long lens, you feel co compressed, you feel tight, you feel confined. A wide angle, you feel distorted and you feel like the, the screen's too big, you know. So what story are you telling is going to determine what lens you use. So why are you deciding that before you even have your script? That doesn't make sense to me. So that's what I tell a, a lot of you know, corporations when I, when I first have a meeting. And I think a lot of them look at me like I'm strange. But I think, um, I think in the end, when they finally get their final product, they're, they're very, very happy that we went through that discussion and talked about that first. Because they become so much clearer on what their own product is. You know, and, and they're the hard questions to ask. They really are. It seems simple. What's your audience and what do you want them to do? That seems like very simple questions. But when you actually ask those questions, you go, oh. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and then everything after that is easy. I can tell you what lens is. I can tell you how to shoot it. I can tell you based on your budget what you can and can't do. Um, but we really have to determine that first. If, if I could give any advice to marketers that from a storytelling standpoint is ask those hard, hard questions first. And then you can then you can decide what bells and whistles and toys and how you want to shoot it and all of that because it'll make sense. It'll it'll, it'll you know I'm not going to shoot a wide angle uh, lens on something that's super serious because there's something fun and outlandish about a wide angle. So why would I shoot your product wide angle if you're a serious product? I just wouldn't do that. You know it just doesn't make sense. Um, but I see it all the time, and I think those those marketers fail. I think those media companies fail because I think they're more interested in their toys than they are in the content. And as you know, content is king. Yeah. <laughs> that's, my, that's my soapbox. I'll get off it. But um, it's very important. I think it's the most important thing. Yeah, you know, you say that um, sometimes you don't know the answer to a question that you have um, within the film until after the film has been released. So, uh, so how do you think the storytelling continues after a film has been released? Um, well, my favorite thing is when I get DMs saying, when's Relish 2 coming out? But, I feel like this, so for, for me in a film, I feel like the storytelling continues with the audience. Um, because I've asked the question, I'm hoping they leave and they're trying to answer it and they're having discussion and, and that's where it continues. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know they'll ever make a relish too. I'm not saying that I wouldn't. I mean, obviously if somebody came to me and said I have X amount of dollars, would you make a relish too? I would love to see where these characters are in, you know, five, 10 years, you know, that would be fun. Um, but I, I didn't write it with that intention. I don't ever think about what happens. I try to tell a complete story from beginning to end. It has to have an ending. Um, you know, I, I, I it was really important to me um, to, to put a punctuation mark, which I won't give it away for spoiler because people haven't seen it, but it was important for me to put a punctuation point at the end of the film in sort of a quasi after credit scene, which really wasn't, but kind of was. Um, but the reason I did that was not because I was trying to allude that there would be a sequel or set up a sequel, is because I wanted to justify a certain character's beliefs with something real because it was easy to laugh at her or him for their thoughts and their beliefs. And it was important for me to, to do that. Um, and it wasn't that I was trying to say, hey, there's a, there's a second one coming, there's another one, which a lot of people thought that's what it was, but that, as a filmmaker, that's not why I did it. I did it was to say what this person believed is valid. And in my world that I've created on screen, that exists. And she was not wrong. You know what I mean? Um, and so that was important to me. Um, so anyway, 
Uh, but I, I don't ever think about a sequel of any kind. I, you know, everyone else tells me if they feel like there should be one or not. You know, people tell me they want a story of Julia, um, and I think she deserves her own story because she's an amazing woman. Um, but until someone writes a check and says, "Make that story," uh, I, I'll, I'll think about it when that happens. You know. Uh, and I have to decide if that's a story I want to tell. With that one, I, I, it's a no-brainer. She's an amazing woman. I would love to tell that story. Um, but, you know, with Relish 2, is, is, it, is it worth it? Is it? I don't know. Is it? I don't know. It'd be interesting to see. What, what story am I telling? That would determine whether or not I make the second one. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if it justifies it, then absolutely. Uh, but I don't set out to do that, to make a second one. Um, I hope that the continuation of the story happens with the audience, that they leave you and have these kind of conversations. You know, I know Tyler and Mateus and, you know, Hannah and, uh, you know, Chelsea have all told me that, you know, they have conversations all the time about the movie and they continue to talk about the movie with, with fans and, and they want, they ask questions and want to know answers to certain things. And to me, that's the continuation. Um, and I think that's, it, whether it was 10 people that saw the movie or a million people that saw the movie, that's what matters to me, not the numbers, is that those 10 people were effective or not, or those million people, you know. Um, and if I can have an effect on people, I think it was the meanest man in Texas. We were in Nashville at the film festival, and we were kicked out because the audience wouldn't leave. So we oh did a Q&A that was supposed to last 20 minutes, and we were there for an hour and a half, and the festival finally had to come in and kick us out. And the conversation continued in the lobby. These were people that just wanted to keep talking about the film. It was done. Two hours had gone by, and we were still in the lobby talking about the film. Um, and ironically, I wasn't doing most of the talking. Uh, they were. Um, and I talk a lot. I know I do. But they were doing all the talking. And to me, that's success. That's, that's where I get excited and why I want to make another film. It's because of that. It's because those people came, watched the film, walked out, and still wanted to talk about it on their own time. You know, that, that to me is, is the best compliment I could get for getting. And I think as a filmmaker, one of the things, you know, I always thought the festivals was sort of a ego thing. You go to festivals so that you can, you know, win awards and be in competition. And after doing my first film, I realized, wow, it's wonderful to go around the country you know, we're jaded in LA, you know, people in LA watch a film and, and they have their, you know, who's in it and who was your costume designer and, you know, who worked on the crew and where is it being distributed and, and all the questions in LA is not about, you know, the actual content uh, or how it moves people. It's all the other peripheral stuff. And so it's so nice to be, you know, in different cities in America and really see people react in the moment to your film. That is that to me is what makes the film festival so amazing is because these people come and they watch it and they react to it and you get to sit in an audience with them and watch them react to it. And oftentimes you get to do a QA and a afterwards and talk to them and hear their response and their questions. And, um, and, and that's what's really amazing. And, and I think that, you know, you get as a filmmaker, you get so bogged down with, um, you know, how it was made and, you know, Oh, how much money did you have and how much post time did you have and and these things and critics you know basically trying to be cute and you know trying to basically they viscerate poor filmmakers with some of their their content you know because they're trying to make a name for themselves and and so you have all these critics who have an agenda when they watch the film and just to sit and watch people in a theater in a dark room watching it solely because the content interests them to me that's what it's all about and that's why you go back and make another one and want to make another one and make another one is because those people you know i think it was robert duvall that, that got up at the academy and said this is wonderful but at the end of the day it's the audience that sat in the audience crying that i do this for it's not for this it's not for this award it's not for you people it's not no i do it for all those people who sat in the audience came saw the movie and were emotionally moved by it because something i did moved them and that's what matters. And so for me as a filmmaker, that's, that's what matters too. And, um, you know, I get the same pleasure to some extent on marketing too. If, if you know, people get excited and want to go see something, it's because you put your you know, heart into it and, and you had a good creative strategy uh, that paid off and, and now it worked. And now suddenly people want to see this or want to buy this or whatever it is. It's the same mentality. It's, it's, it's 
having people be emotionally connected or invested in what you're doing and whether that's a you know a home video a film a television show a documentary a trailer a commercial whatever it is let's talk more about your films a little bit um and the cast and crew so People, man people management is a universal skill, and I'd like to hear about the initial team strategy that you had in place going to directing your first narrative film. So in 2017, uh, in a, a SMC Spotlight interview, you talked about casting director Laura Ward, who uh, was in the same role on Relish, where you said you worked with her to find actors who seemed performance ready due to limited uh, rehearsal time. So this resulted in a cast who came prepared and able to get through the script with very little takes to get it right. So marketing teams also uh, have to work on tight production timelines and need to be able to quickly communicate their objectives and plans. So how did Laura's and other key cast and crew members' efforts contribute to the workflow on such a short filming schedule of 11 days? And uh, what did you take away from the experience to improve on future projects? Um. So the two films were very different in how we cast them. Um, with The Meanest Man in Texas, uh, I was able to have live auditions. So the producer, Brad, Laura, the casting director, and myself uh, were all in the room. I also had the advantage that Mateus was willing to read with them. So now, unlike most casting sessions, you have the lead actor reading with the person. So the chemistry I'm already seeing. So I already know whether or not it works. I don't have to imagine, I don't have to pretend. It's tangible, it's right there in front of you. Um, I also used those experiences, um, two, I think it was two days or three days of, of auditions to work out what I needed to work out with those characters and with those actors. So if I thought somebody had a real good chance of getting the part, I worked with them and I gave them notes. Um, I had a fun story where uh, one of the um, one of the actors turned to um, the producer and he said, "Yeah, I've never had experience like this. I went through the audition process. I, I got my call back, and then I had a director session. Then I had the producer session, and you know, after three, I got the part. And then I come on set, and Justin hasn't given me one note as a director. I must be doing something right. He hasn't given me a note." And the producer smiled and said, "Well, yeah." He goes. How many notes did you give you in your first audition? How many notes did you give you in your second audition? In the producer session, how many notes did he give you? And he goes, oh, wow, a lot. <laughs> yeah, so by the time you're on set, he'd given you all the notes he wanted to give you, and you're a good enough actor to follow them, so why would he give you a note on set? You're doing the performance he wanted, so be proud of that. Um, and I think that's kind of, that's how we use that time. I didn't have time, so I used my casting sessions as my time to work with the actors. So my casting sessions took three days, but that's because I would take hours with each actor. Um, and I'm sure they were confused because they're like, why is this guy spending so much time with me? It's because I could, I had the opportunity where I could literally go through, try it this way, try it this way, do this, do this, try a little of that, try a little of this, and try different ways. And then I knew what it was. So when we got picked to the director's call back, I'd be like, no, remember when I said, do it that way, do it that way. And then I can nail it down. By the time we got to the, to the producers, I was finessing their performance to what I needed. Um, we did a little bit of the same, although not as much, but um, a little bit of the same on uh, Relish. But Relish, I went on 100% instinct on Relish. Um, Laura would bring me, you know, she was amazing. She would go and find like, all these tapes of all these actors she found Cameron and she found you know all these people and she would bring them to me and then I would send like a note to them saying hey love your performance try this and then they would send me a new tape um, and so we didn't have the same luxury of doing um, um, in-person callbacks but everyone got to send in a tape with notes so I gave notes and then they would send them in and I just lucked out because I think everybody, we, we cast a lot of people from people we knew. So Hana, who played the influencer, I'd worked on my teaser before, so I knew her as an actress. Uh, Mateus, obviously, I'd worked with Amina's man, so I wasn't worried about Levi. Um, Rio, um, I had seen in a lot of Disney productions um, and a lot of uh, work he had done. I was familiar with him, and, and realistically, when I wrote it, I kind of had him in mind, so I lucked out getting him. Um, so I knew he was going to nail it. And um, 
So really, Kai was the only one that I didn't know if he was going to be able to do it in Cameron um, because uh, I'd never seen Cameron before, but he responded. His audition was so dang good. And his notes, the way he adapted to my notes was flawless, uh, that it was a no-brainer. And I knew, he, I knew he'd kill it. And then Kai, we worked with. I mean, we worked with uh, Tyler. I worked with him for two weeks to kind of explain what the story was and the character and all of that. Then Mateus took over and sort of taught him set etiquette, taught him how it's going to work, taught him all the terms and how to act and all of the, the he literally got a crash course in, in acting from Mateus for about a month. Uh, and then I came back and worked with him for another two weeks. Then I flew him out to LA and then he had him work with Mateus' coach uh, for a week. Um, and so he literally had about <laughs> two months of crash course in acting because he had never acted before. Um, he had done like some small theater before and that was it. Uh, but certainly never done film. So he was the wild card. He was the one that I had no clue. Um, but I just, everyone I cast, I just had this gut instinct and this faith in them. Um, and, and they were all so passionate about the project that I felt they were going to do the work and we were going to get there. And we did. And everybody had one or two takes. That was it. Uh, and they did it. And it was amazing. You know, I, I, I'm under the same sort of deadlines oftentimes on a corporate project where, you know, we have executives who've never acted before and, you know, they kind of want to do a skit or they want to do something that's funny. Um, and I think, you know, it's time to work outside of on set. I think the problem people run into is they think that everything happens when the camera's in front of the face. Um, and, and really for everybody, the work happens in pre-production. So, you know, if you find out you're shooting in two weeks and you wait till the day of to sort of work on your lines and work on everything that's an executive, you're probably going to have a really rough shoot. Mm -hmm. I like to reach out as soon as I know the project's going, tell them that we only have one day to shoot it. Uh, do they have any questions? Do they want to work with me on anything? I'm open to working with them. Um, and sort of same thing, utilizing that time so that they feel comfortable because if an executive walks onto a set and they are prepared and ready to go like they would a speech, um, they're going to nail it and they're going to walk out of there proud of what they did. And I'm going to save a bunch of time, um, you know, from the, from, from my standpoint, I think the problem that people get into is, you know, the, the problems that I've had the most with, uh, corporate projects is where, you know, an executive walks in and then rewrites the entire thing after studying it and then decides they want to rewrite it. And then you try to shoot it. And then it just becomes, you're in mud. You're just watching your day go by. You're watching their confidence fall. You're watching, you know, the crew getting, getting feeling upset and, and waste of time, um, and and that's when you start to lose your project. Um, I try to I try to really hard, and some executives are too busy, but I try really hard to say, hey, do me a favor, two days out, just just look at your script, and tell me if there's anything you want changed, because if we do it on the day, it's going to hurt the project, you know. Uh, and some executives are too busy, and it doesn't work that way, and you just have to fight it through and you, you get the best you can, but. I find most of them, if you reach out to them before, they want to do a good job and they're nervous about getting in front of a camera. Um, and anything you can do to make them feel more comfortable is only going to help them to succeed and the video succeeds. So I, I find it to be a good strategy, even in marketing, where you know, you, you, a lot of people I think are afraid to reach out to their bosses and say, hey, have you done, you know what I mean? Um, so I'll, I'll often take that off the plate. So then I can be the bad guy that's bugging them two days before going, hey, have you looked at it? Have you thought about it? Have you want to talk about it? I'm here. You know, that sort of thing. Um, but I think that's, that's where a lot of the problem is the hierarchy in, in corporations where people are afraid to say to their boss, you, you kind of need to prepare. Um, and so I just sort of ask for that up front when I start. I just say, hey, can I get the executive's extension? I'm going to give them a call two days before, see how they're doing, see if they need any help. Um, some people are kind of taken aback by that, but most executives are thrilled. Um, I find the exact opposite of what everyone's fear is, is that they are like, oh yeah, I have more information about this project than I ever thought. This is great. Oh, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to meet you. And now they're excited about the project. They walk in, they knock it out of the park and everyone goes home happy. That's, that's, that's what you want to do. And it's no different when you're working with actors, they want to be prepared too. So it's just, it's, it's, it's allowing that situation where someone walks in and knows what they're doing, they're going to be more confident, they're going to give a better performance, whether it's a PowerPoint presentation or a skit or an actor doing a really deep part. You have to, pre-production is so important. 
and I'm, I'm always baffled when they're like, oh, we have one day of production, but we're not going to talk about anything till that one day. And I'm like, so you just want to shoot yourself in the foot? Is that your game plan? Like, that makes no sense to me. Yeah. But okay, I'll do whatever you want, you know. And then I just spend a little more of my time sort of finding a way to reproduce uh, and just consider it part of the deal. Just because I want it to succeed. And it has to succeed, so everyone's happy. Was there, like, any point in your career where, um, you know, you sort of made that decision where – uh, you're going to go forward, moving forward, you're going, going to utilize your time um, as, like, as best as possible. Like, what, was there a moment where you made sort of a mistake and you were like, I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to be <laughs> as prepared as possible. Well, I don't like to be prepared. Um, a lot of people, you know, compliment me and say, oh, you're so good on the fly. I'm like, I'm not good on the fly. That's like option number 12, and I didn't want to go to it, but I did because of all of the circumstance killed my first 11 options. Mm -hmm. I, I really, you know, and I've done it enough that I, I have experience to know, okay, I can get away with this, or I can get away with that. There's nothing worse than trying to figure something out on the fly. It's just, it, it's the worst feeling in the world. And so I learned that really early on, you know. Um, I, I think having dealt with documentaries, you're in more of a position of, Oh, okay. I didn't expect that. How do I deal with that now? Because you're capturing what's happening in the moment. Um, whereas a narrative, you're much more in control, or a corporate project, you're much more in control. It's not so, um, it's not so willy nilly, and things just don't happen, you know. Um, so having that experience helps. But no, I don't think anybody wants to be unprepared. And, and so for me, early on, I learned even even on a documentary where anything can happen, I still go in prepared. You know, I still know what I want to shoot. I may throw it out the window based on what just happened. I may rearrange my objective based on what happened. Um, but I certainly go in with a game plan. I certainly go in prepared. I, I don't think I've ever not gone into a situation and gone, I don't know what I'm doing today. I'm just going to figure it out on the fly. Um, but I have been in situations where it's like all my other options don't work based on my experience, based on what the story I'm telling, how do I adapt? That's different because you've done the preparation. And I think that helps you with that decision. If you've done no preparation, just going on the fly is just ridiculous. So, um, yeah, I, I learned that, I think, on my first project. I had, uh, I had to shoot um, an interview with an athlete, uh, and I didn't know as much as I wanted to have, as I should have. Um, and he could not answer any of my questions that I had. He just, we didn't connect at all. Um, and, and so that's, I think that's when I sort of realized, you know what, I, I, I need to do more research. I need to be more prepared. This is embarrassing. This isn't going well. Um, you know, fortunately in that case, I just played dumb and asked stupid questions until finally he latched onto one and answered it. Um, <laughs> but it was not fun. <laughs> and yeah, I, so at that point I'm like, nope, never again. I'm always going to be prepared. Yeah. Let's talk about promotion. So you've done a lot of marketing campaigns for corporate brands, like you mentioned, including Lexus, Hawaii Convention Bureau, Visitors Bureau, LA County Hospitals, and many more. So I want to touch on promoting a film using that marketing perspective. So my first question is, how is social media being leveraged in the film space today? And are there any platforms that you'll be implementing in your work looking ahead? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think having done so much promotional work through the NFL and CBS Sports and NBC Sports and um, you know, Warner Brothers and Disney. I've, I've done so much promotional work and so many trailers and teasers and commercials for them um, that when I, it comes to my own films, I, it's sad, but I even as I'm writing, I'm like, oh, that's a good trailer moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it just sort of, it's, it's, it's now inherent, you know, you just kind of go, oh, wow, that one line kind of sums up the whole movie. So that's definitely a trailer moment. Um, but I think, I think what people get sidetracked is sometimes a trailer or a commercial or a promotion of a certain project, whatever it is. I mean, it could be an event that you're holding and you're trying to get people to come to it, is that you're not selling the best shot. You're not selling the most creative shot. You're not selling the bells and whistles. Again, you're selling... What is it that the person wants to connect to that will get them to go see it, buy it, 
go there, whatever. Um, and sometimes, you know, people make the mistake when they do a movie trailer is they put in the most beautiful shots. And that's, that's great, but that's not what sells a movie. What sells a movie is, do I connect with the characters? Um, and so that's what I try to do when I do all my trailers, which I've been lucky enough to be involved with, with them. I did, for National Geographic, I was involved in the trailer for Rockstars, uh, that documentary film series. For the UFC, I was involved in all the trailers for all of their product. Um, so I had three shows that I produced for Spike TV that were all for Ultimate Fighting, and I was heavily involved in the promotion of those shows too. That was part of the deal was, oh, you gotta do this. All the extreme sports, I had to do uh, the commercials uh, on those same networks for. So um, it, for me, it always goes hand in hand. It always goes, I can't tell this story until I know who's watching. And, it, and then once I know that, then the trailer's easy. So I think once you know those questions that we asked before, it's who's this for and why are they, why do they care? Uh, those are the things that are going to help your promotion. Those are the things that are going to, like when I do my trailer, um, you know, who's going to want to watch this movie and why? Okay, well, that's what I got to sell, not my great, amazing shot that I love so much because some of my best shots aren't even in my trailers. Um, and people ask me, why aren't they in the trailer? I'm like, because that's not, I'm trying to tell the story. I'm selling the film. I'm not selling that one shot. I'll put that on my reel, you know? Uh, that'll sell me as a director, but to, to sell the trailer, you have to, tell, you have to story tell. Yeah, I think, again, you know, if you can connect with, with a character, if you can connect with something and make it personal for people, you're gonna be more successful. And, you know, that's, that's kind of, um, the way you know when i used to shoot scenics for the maui visitor bureau uh you know I, I often would put just you know feet or an umbrella or a drink or something in the shot so that people could see themselves on that beach it's just a beautiful beach is a beautiful beach and and if you see a beautiful beach you go, oh it's a beautiful beach but if you see uh, an umbrella with a mai tai and you know snorkeling gear at the foot of it you go Oh man, I want to be there. Yeah. That could be me. And now suddenly that one shot means something to somebody who's watching. They're more likely to pick up the phone and go, I'm booking a you know, trip to, to, to Maui. Um, a beautiful beach is a beautiful beach. It's just a beautiful beach. You know, it, it's generic, you know, and I think that's, that's the important thing. I think that's what makes good, good storytelling is specific, specificity. <laughs> you know? um, it's really important to be specific. It's, it's, that's what matters. It's, it's, you know, a beach is a beach, but a beach with something I connect to on that beach that puts me in the, on that beach. Now, suddenly I'm drawn to it. I'm connected. And, and now you're marketing. Now you're, you're, you're telling a story and the story is going to be in, in, in the person's mind. of like, well, that should be me. I should be having my time on that beach. And now their whole mentality is different than just, Oh, that's a pretty beach. So I just have some wrap up questions. So, uh, some of your team members were on two sides of production of your film. So Casey Bond was a producer on The Meanest Man in Texas and also played Marvin Harper. And on Relish, Matthias Ward played a Levi and also served as a co-producer. So did you receive any feedback from either Casey or Matthias on how to better move through production based on what they experienced acting in the film? Uh, that's funny. He picked those two. Um, <laughs> Matthias was instrumental in Relish. Uh, because he is of the generation that I was aiming for. Right. Yep. So being, you know, at, at that point, I think he was 21 or something like that. Um, he was even more so than young kids. That, that movie, I think, really does hit people sort of going into college or in college, more so than like a 15, 16-year-old. So I used him a lot as a producer, sort of, to see my audience through his eyes as a lens. So he was instrumental in that. Um, K Casey Bond, um, it's hard to say, but it's just the truth. Casey Bond was a producer by default. He is the one that basically came in and he ended up getting the rights to the book. He was the one that ran with Brad the production company. Um, but as a creative producer on set, he really just, he really just, he, act, he had done his work as a producer. You know what I mean? 
Um, there's different types of producers. Um, and once you get on set, it really does become the director's film. Um, the producers do what they can to sort of help the director in his vision, but he becomes the, the captain of the ship. I'm sure you've heard that before. Uh, it's his ship to steer, uh, and the producers do all the work beforehand. So where Casey did his work was he connected me and Don so that I can get all the information from Don that I needed to get. Where Casey did the work was, you know, he submitted to all the, the film festivals and went behind the scenes and talked to Nashville and, you know, basically greased the wheels so that we could come in as a group and be able to present it there and set up the Q&A. So that, those are the kind of things that a producer does all before the film or after the film is finished and distribution. Brad was responsible for getting distribution for the film. Brad was responsible for hiring the people that handle the financing. Um, but creatively, realistically, um, Casey was wonderful about simply coming in on set as an actor. And so he just came in and said, I, I, you know, I have questions about my character. I have questions. He didn't try to meddle in everybody else's stuff as a producer, which a lot of them do. He came in and just said, this is what I'm thinking of my character. And he really did while he was on set be just, just an actor. Um, and, and so I, I respect him and appreciate that. Um, as a producer before, he obviously, he's the one that found the project and brought it to him and Brad, and then they raised the money. So um, that, that kind of was where the, the work happened. Um, and he was gracious enough to early on set me up with Dawn and uh, all of that, so. Awesome. Okay, and then can you please share um, uh, what you feel were some of the cast's and crew's greatest achievements on set of The Meanest Man in Texas and Relish, and what were some personal wins for you? Uh, every day was a win. Okay. We had an impossible task. <laughs> uh, 11 days, four decades, uh, costume changes, every scene. Um, you know, it was, it was insane. We were in 120 degree weather in Los Angeles in the heat of summer for this man texas uh i think we had somebody go to the hospital at one point um it was absolutely oh terrible God. conditions um yeah and so the fact that we even made a film is unbelievable um but what happened was is i think it was maybe like our second setup i uh i, I turned to my dp and i said um I, i'll be surprised if we even get this movie made i mean i'm 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 going to do it, but I'm just surprised that, you know, it's 120 degrees. This is insane. There's no way. And, and someone was standing over my shoulder and they said, don't worry, you've got the crew on your, you've got your crew as your back. We have your back. And I turned around, I smiled and he said, we're all looking at the same monitor as you. It's rare that you see something so amazing and such an important story. And I think that's what got me through my first two films is I think everyone on set, actors, crew members, everybody, they knew it was a special movie. I wasn't making a horror film. You know, I wasn't making, you know, Slash or 12. Um, I was making something that had resonance and had importance. Um, and I think that they saw it manifesting through the lens on the screen. And crews buy into that. You know, if they think it's gonna be another Slash or 12, and it's not going to be very good, and the director doesn't care, you're not going to get a good film because the crew is going to back out. They're going to be like, I'm just collecting my paycheck now. But if they see something that's worthwhile, and they see something that they connect to, and they see something that they want to be a part of and proud of, you're going to see them step up and go way beyond. And that's what they did. This film crew did that. They stepped up beyond what I could imagine. And same thing with Relish. Relish different because it was not a period piece but had the lgbtq plus community and, and and they realized how important it was and how different it was and they saw that the images we were making and the performances we were getting was astounding um and they did the same thing they stepped up and obviously a lot of them were the same crew um but they saw the end game they saw the end zone they saw what we were trying to achieve and everyone stepped up to do what they could to help get it done um and and that's what it takes it takes a team working that hard to make it happen and, and I was lucky enough to have that. So please tell our audience a little bit more about The Furry Fortune and when we can expect to watch it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, The Furry Fortune is a wonderful family film, uh, which is a little departure for me. I think after quarantine, um, I relished the idea of doing um, a, uh, a fun light movie. Um, and that's what it is. So it's, 
it's really um, Brad came to me, the producer of Meanest Man Texas, and who's my consulting producer on Relish. He came to me and said, hey, would you ever do a family film? And I said, well, you know, the truth is, is I haven't seen a lot of them. It's like, yeah, but this one has a dog. And I'm like, well, I'm going to be honest. I haven't even seen a lot of, unless it's, you know, uh, John Wick. I really haven't seen, uh, you know, a dog film. Um, I haven't seen Lassie. I haven't seen Benji. None of those movies are what I, kind of movies I watch. So I said, if you're okay with me writing a movie that I would want to watch, then I'm happy to write the movie. And he said, go for it. So I ended up making the dog movie and family movie I wanted to make, which is about two kids whose family was, the boy sort of makes this, this wish that, you know, he could have all the money in the world to solve all the problems. Well, as you know, uh, that doesn't solve all the problems. And so once he got his wish, which is all the money he could ever imagine, uh, his family even was more splintered. Um, and so it's really about, you know, a boy's love for his dog that brings his family back together. And that's kind of the crux of the story. Um, and I, you know, I really focused on the relationship between the two kids. I'd never worked with kids before. And, and I, I love movies that put kids in situations that adults are in, but coming from a kid's point of view. So uh, I made them have to go through adventures and I made them have to go through everything. Um, and, and they had to sort of grow as, as characters and come out on the other side like you would an adult character. Um, and so I really did that to them. And, and I also paid homage to all my favorite movies. So literally this is my uh, love story to Hollywood and all the films that I grew up on. Uh, so you'll see a lot of references to other movies. Um, I don't know when it's coming out. I just gave this morning, actually, I just gave the drive to the editor. He's called me about seven times um, as we've been talking. Um, but um, he, he has all the footage and he's going to do a string out and we'll see where we are. It was done, uh, again, very quickly, way too quickly. Um, and so uh, probably going to need some pick up days. Uh, but um, it's, you know, these kids are amazing. Um, they're super talented. The dog was absolutely stunning and beautiful. Um, and uh, I got some great supporting actors to come in and have some fun and play. Um, I think it's going to be uh, a little gem. I think it's going to be a fun little movie that uh, everyone, same thing, everybody on set was really excited by the script. And, you know, a lot of people <laughs> called me and said, you know, I got the script and it said the furry fortune and I almost didn't get the page one. <laughs> and they said but then i read it and i realized that this is actually really really a great story so um i'm very proud of it i i never done a dog movie or a kid movie never worked with dogs or a kid uh so it was really fun to, to do that and i had a blast with the kids and there's several pictures of me being a big kid with the kids on set um so it was fun to not be in my sort of you know, overthinking intellectual mode with Relish and the meanest man in Texas and be sort of in a kid mode and go, I got to see the world through the kid's eyes for, you know, the duration of shooting this film. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I did. So I literally was just a big kid on set. It was fun. Well, once again, you can watch the meanest man in Texas and Relish. I'll link in the description below this video. And thank you so much for chatting with me, Justin. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure. So thanks so much. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. It was great talking to you.